So welcome to the Brave Bold Brilliant podcast. I am your host, Jeanette Linfoot, and I am joined today by the podpreneur himself, the no less Alex Chisnell. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. Welcome. Great to see you in person and really appreciate you inviting me on. Excited. So what's it going to be like being on the other side of the mic then, Alex? That's the question. It is. And I haven't done many interviews. I've literally, I think I could count them on, on one hand how many podcast interviews I've done. Whereas I've, I've interviewed probably, oh, yeah, don't even want to go there how many episodes I've actually interviewed. So... Excellent. Well, listen, uh, you know, I actually take it as a great privilege that you agreed to do this then. So I, you know, it's fantastic to see you here. So you know what I'd like to do, Alex, is start how I typically like to start these interviews with your journey. So do you want to just tell us whatever you want to tell us about your life, where, how things started for you and where you are now, and then we're going to dig in from there. Mm, Yeah, sure. So I think for me, a good place to start would be, um, when I left school, I went to uni in Bath, so I moved from Wales to England. Um, I then developed a real interest in journalism and all things audio specifically. So when I left, I'd already be doing some some hospital radio programs, which back in the day was the way most people started in, in radio. Um, and then I then started with BBC Radio Wales in, in Cardiff um, as a journalist, then a presenter, and uh, my first interview was actually Lennox Lewis, who was wow. um, heavyweight champion of the world at the time. So you've only got one way to go after that, really, haven't you? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the second one was Neil Kinnock, who um, you'll remember as leader of the, the opposition party to, Ma- to Maggie Thatcher at the time. So aging me this, uh, this, this interview already, but I'm just kind of putting context. That's how I started. And... Um, my theory was that that was it. I was going to be a journalist, presenter of BBC Radio, but um, I was lured away by going to work for Virgin Atlantic. And I loved travel. I'd spent time growing up in Canada as a kid. At my summers at university, I used to go to America and I used to coach tennis and canoeing and um, various other sports and um, counsel young kids age uh, uh, like 10 to 16 that kind of thing she used to live with them for the summer and loved it best summers of my life and then uh like I say swayed by virgin um I joined as cabin crew to literally just see the world for two years fast forward 17 years later and <laughs> um eventually inspired by my boss at the time Richard Branson I'd always wanted to set up my own business and I just kept putting it off putting it off waiting for the perfect time like so many of us do procrastinating procrastinating and I could do my job with my eyes shut I'd gone as high as I could go within um, my my sector working for Virgin I couldn't go any further so um, I decided to take the option of voluntary redundancy back in the last recession 2009 and I kind of held out, held out, and they just kept making better offers. And I took it. And it, at the time, it was like a year's salary and free travel for two years with unlimited upper class upgrades for me and my family. And I was like, well, this is a really good deal, isn't it? <laughs> From a travel <laughs> perspective. So um, I had a bit of a safety net, I guess, um, when I left compared to a lot of people. And um, I decided to decided to start my own business. And the first one didn't pan out. I'd left with the premise of somebody funding that business for me and uh, they didn't (laughs) and so that completely changed my plans and I fell into the health and fitness industry and I retrained in a former iteration of my life as a health and fitness professional so personal trainer and then sports injury got really interested in the clients I was working with kept getting injured they were training for marathons that kind of thing triathlons so I set up a sports injury clinic and at that point in my life, I, I, met, I came across a company who opened my eyes called NPE Fitness. And bizarrely, at the time that you're recording me interviewing this now, last night I signed a deal to actually make their podcast for them. So this is quite Ooh. serendipitous that nearly 10 years later, I'm working with them um, on their podcast. But um, yeah, at the time, they opened my eyes to the fact that you didn't just have to be a personal trainer working with clients, you could actually be a business owner and employ other people. So I took that step back. And in hindsight, I did it far too quickly. But I scaled it and I had therapists working for me. We had two locations in Bournemouth and in Sandbanks in Paul. 
Um, we had uh, like group fitness with like boot camps, mobile fitness with trainers going to people's homes. And um, it was great and I loved it. And I then lost my mojo for it. Um, cut a long story short, I got uh, invited by a couple of friends at the time to go and uh, mentor uh, a YMCA scheme where you would go into the schools, kids would pitch their business idea. Uh, the winners would go before a panel. Uh, we would each, as uh, members of the panel, mentor a group of kids through to their business idea. And um, that just got me, that hooked me. And I just thought, oh, I just want to do this. I just love helping people with their businesses. I love these ideas. And again, serendipitously, maybe a week later after that, uh, an advert popped up on my Facebook feed. It was for Virgin Startup and they were asking for mentors. And I thought, who the hell are Virgin Startup? I worked for Virgin for like 17 years. I've never heard of this company. And it was a brand new Virgin business. And it was Richard's not-for-profit helping um, leverage the government's startup loan scheme. And Richard's take on that was as well as applying for a loan, you would also get a mentor for the first um, year that you're in business, I think. So at the time I thought I'd loved helping kids start businesses and I've no idea how I will get to that point, but this is calling to me. Clearly the Virgin, I mean, what my wife said to me, you're so going to do this. You're so going to get, you know, reeled back in by Richard and the Virgin name. And, and of course I did. It's a really strong pull. So I did that and I went from, um, mentor to part-time business advisor got asked to become a business advisor then got asked to be a full-time business advisor and then they told me i was the number one business advisor in the uk and would i like to take over a chunk of the business and run it for them so i took on like nine counties i think in the uk basically from liverpool down to brighton and they focused on greater london really and um and i loved it and i and i really enjoyed it but uh during part of that journey uh, we decided to make a podcast and I was really into podcasting, listened to podcasts and I was like, I'll do that for us. And that essentially led me to leaving them because I got so in love with podcasts and so many people asking me to help with their podcasts that I went all in on podcasting. Um, working with a government scheme became more and more difficult because every year there was more rules and more red tape. And it just seemed to become very hard to actually help the people that we were meant to help. And mm. I kind of lost my love of that as well. Just like I'd kind of lost my mojo with the health and fitness, to be honest with you um, before. So I've gone through a number of di different iterations in my, in my business life. And um, yeah, a couple of years ago, I just went all in on podcasting and was like, right, let's, um, let's help other people, but let's formalize it. Let's create, and for want of a better word, an agency, you know, um, and now I, I, I run Podpreneur, which is, which is a podcast agency born out of launching this podcast for Virgin Startup that eventually became my own podcast, which is called Screw It, Just Do It. And um, yeah, here I am today, chassis to you. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that it. Works. I love it. Yay! <laughs> so much in there though isn't there Alex you know mm. I mean it's and you've had as you as you rightly describe you know almost sort of like a quite a number of different phases of your career you know sort of probably four or five actually within Correct. that where you know and um, I want to just come back to the entrepreneurial side of things because pretty much everything that you've done in one guise or another has been very entrepreneurial okay within Virgin initially yes. and then kind of branching out doing your own thing so you know did your how did your early life, family life, maybe, or the early years um, sort of as growing up, where did that entrepreneurial spirit come from? Did it did it come from your parents or kind of early starts or was it really just from being around Branson that that sort of really ignited your, you know, your sort of love for it? Where did it come from? Yeah, great question. I, I, I think it came from from Richard. And, you know, one of my regrets in hindsight is that I, I wish that actually at the age of 24, you know, in my twenties, when I was there, that I'd actually asked him some sensible questions rather than just sharing a beer and other uh, other things with him. You know, other things like beer and champagne and wine. Um, but at the <laughs> time, you know, it was just like you know, you're in a room party with Richard Branson, who owns you know record company, run, you know, owns an airline and all the rest of it, and it was just great fun to be part of that. But um, so I think it came. I think it ultimately came from him because when I look back, you know, my mother. 
wasn't wasn't entrepreneurial um although she has definitely been you know the the steadying influence in my life I was brought up by my mother i worked for virgin where every day i went to work i was literally me maybe one other guy and 18 females you know and my my wife and two daughters so it's always been females very strong influence in my life um my father my so parents split up when i was about 10 i was going into high school so 11 i guess and he worked for big corporations um like the unilevers of the world mm. but it's interesting and i've never kind of really talked about it but a story there and my mother's never been able to to let it go um and and maybe that you know if, if i saw a therapist did peel all these layers back but like keep it short and sweet is that according to my mother, the story was that, you know, we were living this in Toronto, just outside Toronto, this area called Oakville, which is called something like Millionaire's Row or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, all these, you know, massive house, swimming pool, acres of land, etc. And the last I heard, like Donovan Bailey, the Canadian sprinter, who, you know, won Olympic gold had, had bought our old, our old house, but he lost it in a business deal. So I think that's why my, my mother's always been and it's very, very much been in the act. She couldn't believe it, you know, when I went to leave Virgin, for example. You know, you've got a steady job, steady career, you know what money you're going to earn. But for me, it was always like, you know, yeah, but there's a ceiling on that. There's always a ceiling on how much I can earn. Um, and then, you know, so, so, so there was that from her. Then we had a house in Henley upon Thames, literally on the Thames River. And, or, you know, when the river rose, you know, all the houses would get flooded but we lived in you know some amazing houses that cost a lot of money and I think probably subconsciously to me that was kind of drummed into me and maybe that held me back from leaving Virgin because I wanted to leave for quite a few years that I felt I'd kind of reached as far as I could go mm. um, and I just didn't know where to go next what step to take what was the first step to doing and, and I think just that uh, voluntary redundancy opportunity that came up um, that I took. And, and just to finish, that only came up because I'd never, I wasn't considering it seriously. And then my wife, who was a beauty therapist um, for Virgin in upper class, so she'd do the massages and manicures, they made all 300 of the beauty therapists um, compulsory, compulsory, easy for me to say, <laughs> redundant. And that maybe sharpened my mind. And I just thought, you know what? There'd be a bit of uh, symmetry about this if, if I left. And I always said I would leave before I would turn 40. And I was like, right, this is this is it. So let's just bite the bullet and yeah, screw it. Just do it essentially, I guess. <laughs> no yeah. pun intended. Yeah. Oh God, there's loads in here, isn't there? Because I think what's, <laughs> honestly, we could chat, we're going to chat for hours. We could chat for hours. Um, no, but seriously, I think it, it is fascinating because, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit and like you're saying, well, I want to pick up first of all on what you were saying about your mum. And sometimes the people that are closest to you are often the ones that maybe kind of can put doubts in, in your mind. And it's it's nine times out of 10, it's from a position of love and concern, isn't it? You know, if you're, yeah. why would you leave a great job? You're working for brands and it's a brilliant brand, la, 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 la. Because you're worried about, for you, what what's yeah. next? And um, and it can be hard, isn't it? And I find that with people sometimes that I, I work with, that that can really blow them off track, you know, and then um, actually having that courage to still believe that, no, this does feel right. I'm going to make mm. that jump. I am going to be brave which is one of the words in this podcast and yeah. kind of make make that leap and like you say you'd probably been thinking about it for a while anyway and it was the push yeah. that you needed um, yeah so so what advice would you give Alex to someone that's maybe in a similar situation maybe they are reasonably comfortable um, in their job enjoy what they do but they've got this sort of feeling inside that there is more um, maybe don't know how to kind of articulate that or, you know, get a clear path. What would you advise them to do? Yeah, another, another good question. Um, and it's, it's interesting since I've essentially become a business owner and entrepreneur myself, and especially working with Virgin Startup, where I think I worked out, I'd helped over 500 businesses when, when I left. And, and I never thought this, but you can actually be entrepreneurial in another business. And I, I saw that with Virgin. And I remember going to the battleship building in, in London where the HQ is and just looking at the wall. And there was a, trying to work out what floor to go on because every company just said Virgin, 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 Virgin. And there was over 220 Virgin bloody companies. And I was just like, ah, wow. wow. And I saw what Richard did. And he's at the time there was Virgin Startup. 
but then they started Virgin Sport. And I saw what he did, and he literally took somebody who was already doing what he wanted them to do. And this, the lady at the time for Virgin Sport was running the biggest sporting organization in the world or the sporting, biggest sporting event in the world, which was the New York Marathon. And he took her, the CEO of the New York Marathon, put her behind the desk in London, gave her like, I think three maximum, yeah, two or three support staff and went, go and build a business. But he incentivized her, you know, with shares, mm. et cetera. And he did the same with the CEO of Virgin Startup because she was at the the Prince's Trust beforehand doing exactly what she was doing. So I think you can be entrepreneurial within an organization. Um, and for me, what I used to see a lot of was people torn between the choice of, do I literally quit the job and go and start the business or do I start the side hustle and launch the business? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I read, you know, some great books by a chap called Chris Gillibeau, um, the, the $100 startup, is that what it's called? Uh, and mm -hmm. listen to his podcast. And I definitely think you can do that. Um, I also applaud people who, um, you know, take that risk of just literally going for it. But I, I think it's, it, it, the older I get, I probably think there's more, it, it really is down to the individual and your circumstances because you're not going to chuck it all in if you've literally just had a, a baby just been born, you've just moved to a brand new house and you've saddled yourself with more mortgage debt so I, I really do think there's not a right or wrong answer with that one I think it, it comes down to the individual um, and what I learned especially working with, with with Richard is that every he he looked like portrayed by the media as really risky but when you compare it to BA who was so conservative every, every um, choice Richard made and you'll know this from your history in the travel industry was a calculated risk he researched mm -hmm. these ideas to death he wouldn't just make a decision you know on the flip of a coin so I, I think it's make a, a balanced, but brave, bold and brilliant decision um, would be my advice, uh, and which, is, which is what I kind of think I did in hindsight. And it's, it, it certainly didn't happen overnight. And we've you know, become familiar with Maria Hatzis-Stefanis from Rodial on, on, on Clubhouse. And, um, you know, those kinds of decisions, you know, you make, there is no such thing as an overnight success. For me, I felt that it had literally taken me the 10, 11, even 12 years to, to get where I am now you know mm. yeah no so so true actually and sometimes I think you just reach a certain point in your life and you you're much more comfortable in your own shoes you're much more self-aware you've kind of got enough gravitas experience under your belt that you know what you're doing but you've still got the fire in the belly you know mm. to want to do something and you you know so maybe uh, maybe it's something around being at that sort of age as well yeah so, I think you're right you know, but you're absolutely right. There isn't one one solution, is there? Everyone is different. Everyone's circumstances are different. But how, how um, I mean, it must have been fast paced working with Richard so closely as well as you did. And, yeah. and what did what did that teach you around failure as well? Because I think the other thing is you're right. Richard's very, clearly a very savvy, savvy businessman. Otherwise, he wouldn't be where he is today. But your his image um, and his his sort of the extrovert approach that he puts out there to the media is very different to how he is in reality, who's more introverted, I think, and more measured than, than is presented. But what did that teach you around business, sort of the balance between going for it and failing and succeeding? Because not every virgin business is a roaring success, as we know, but you know that's not always commonly understood, is it? So what, what, what's it's the not. approach to failure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of those failures are, you know, are in the past. And I, I guess when people are looking at um, Virgin Galactic, for example, and I, near, I nearly, at the time I was with Virgin Star, I actually applied for a job there and I got down to the last two um, for a, this amazing job with, with Virgin Galactic, which again, in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't get because it wouldn't mm. have led me to doing what I'm doing, but it would have been yeah. a fantastic job because you were liaising with the clients who'd um, bought a ticket to be on you know the rocket to um to space you know so um and, and many people thought you know that was going to be a failure I mean, and it still could be a failure of course you know although it's now valued at more than, than virgin atlantic that's where he's borrowed the money to prop up virgin atlantic you know mm. um and it only takes one accident which they had to completely derail the plans but yeah people don't realize like i was there when we had the launch of virgin cola in south africa at the time in johannesburg and that all that took was Pepsi and Cola getting together and just making sure he couldn't put a bottle on a shelf of a supermarket in the end. 
you know, if you yeah. read those stories. But at the time, it was like, why wouldn't Virgin do cola? We have a bright red logo. <laughs> um, <laughs> can slap a Virgin name on it. And then another one was Virgin Brides, which I always remember was a cabin crew, a, a, a fellow cabin crew member whose idea it was that went to Richard. And they're opening, you know, a one-stop shop for brides on high streets. And, you know, um, who didn't think at the time with the name virgin with brides that just uh, you know the and you think about now with social media wasn't around then but the amount of fun you could have with a brand <laughs> like that so yeah you're right at the time it, it i think it was more of a fine line than people realize now in the public perception of, mm. of, of the brand is so we all know that, that, that you know between success and failure it can often just be such a fine margin and the decisions you know you make but for me it's often you know just be decisive, you know, be bold, just make a bloody decision. Don't just sit there <laughs> procrastinating, which 99% of people do, which is why 99% of people aren't entrepreneurs and aren't business owners. Yeah, no, very, very good, good, insightful points there. So, you know, when you were cabin crew, Alex, were you actually cabin crew? How many years did you fly? Um, so I, I started off as a, um, as cabin crew and I finished up as a as a flight manager so I was literally mm. there I did do a little stint with air tours beforehand that's what I actually got which was out of Cardiff actually and that got me the appetite I think it was a combination of that and having um gone to the states every summer with the tennis coaching and and the, the decision it was the time was like I'm going to apply for Virgin I just love get America I love American culture yeah. I love yeah. the music I love the you know the country um combined that with flying and, and that travel bug uh, which my mum had you know you can kind of go back my mum um my, my father was a sea captain a merchant sea captain sorry my grandfather my mother's father and she literally at the age of 17 asked to get off the ship in Canada and um, start a new life and he just went you're you're you're, you're, you're 17 you're legal you do what you like, go for it. You got my blessing. So she literally got off the ship and um, started a life at the ages, which which is nuts now to think when I've got daughters who are like 14 and 12, which she did that. So I think that's clearly where the travel bug, um, where the travel bug um, came from in my life. But yeah, cabin crew for many years, many, many years. And, you know, some of my closest friends are still cabin crew at Virgin. So many of them have lost their job in the last 12 months though, which is, mm. you know, heartbreaking. And they never actually got to do a last flight and kind of say goodbye to that career that and it's not a career it's a lifestyle everybody who's ever been cabin crew will will tell you that you know you don't do it for the money you do it for this amazing champagne lifestyle on lemonade money you know yeah <laughs> Yeah, and listen, the travel bug, it definitely gets you. I mean, gosh, I've spent 25 years plus in the industry, so I know exactly wow. what you're talking about. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not fully in it now, but I still have a foot in, in, in there with the work that I do. But um, I think what's really interesting as well about, about when you're a travel person um, and when you're cabin crew, people often think it is a glamorous job, and it is. You know, there's got lots of, you know, you see the world and go to places you could never dream of. But it, you're still at the coal face, you know, you are dealing with customers day in, day out, and that isn't always easy. So Got for that. you, um, you know, how did, how did that early experience of having to deal with customers day in, day out, not always happy customers either, because that's just the way mm. it goes. How did that help you in business, uh, you know, from actually having that operational background? Yeah, and you know when I trace when I when I trace it back again, it definitely came from my mother because she was used to being on her own, essentially bringing me and my brother up on her own, and mm. frequently going to events and being um, on her own, not not with somebody else, and having to kind of infiltrate those those circles. And you know, I could never do it. But she'd literally just walk up and literally just go, you know, "Hi, I'm Sandra. Who are you? And what do you do? Or how do you know, you know, Jim and Kerry or whatever." And I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe you do that. But I think, again, subconsciously, that's led to me um, doing what I do. And I've been hosting live events for, you know, the last six years with Virgin Startup and then with Festival of Enterprise at the, at the NEC and Olympia. Um, and, you know, yeah, that initial customer service, I was probably terrified, you know, of... Um, of 400 passengers co coming on a plane, you know, and then... Um, dealing with the, and you, you, you're given like the best customer service training that it, it, it's a certain breed of people, especially 
Virgin um, attract and train. They definitely attract a certain type of person and the training is, mm. is second to none. And in, whenever I'm at a restaurant or any kind of hospitality um, venue, and my wife's the same, you're literally grading everybody. You know, you're looking at everything and thinking, oh my God, I cannot believe you've just, you know, done that, you know. <laughs> um, so, and, and I always remember seeing somebody and this stayed with me and I can't remember her name, but I always remember seeing somebody who was looking after the premium economy passengers on the upper deck of the plane. And I was in charge of the plane. She was one of the seniors um, looking after the premium economy cabin. I remember going up there and she knew by two hours into the flight, she knew every name of the passengers. And, and that's a skill. That is Absolutely. a total skill. And, and she, she just stood out head and shoulders above everybody else to be able to, because people, especially if you're flying in like a premium or an upper class cabin, um, quite often they, they fly a lot. They are frequent flyers. They expect um, to be addressed by their, their first name. You know, it kind of comes with it, which, which you'll mm. know. And those people who, who got that right, like she did, that's kind of stayed with me as like a great, um, you know, piece of customer service over, over the years. And, and I've just taken that with me through into area, every other area of my life, which I think I find it really easy to, to speak to anyone because with one minute I would be speaking to, let me give you, you know, an example. I would be speaking to somebody in 65E who was taking their family from Barry with, you know, five kids to Orlando for the trip of a lifetime. The next flight, I'll be sat at the bar in upper class pouring drinks for Tom Jones, you know, and it literally was that varies, you know, or um, uh, David Beckham and the whole Manchester United football team and Richard Branson, you know, it's crazy. But, you know, it, it is very much, you know, sink or swim. You learn those skills at the coalface, as you say, 100 percent. And those, yeah. that's definitely stayed with me all my life. Yeah, well, listen, people are people, aren't they? And and every, and I think it is. You obviously learned from the wonderful Sandra how to do it from a very young age, you know. And uh, if you can make that one person feel like they're the most important person in the world at that point of time, then that's a yeah. real gift. It's a real magic, I think, to have. And um, yeah, I can see that in you, Alex. It, it, you exude it, my friend, in so <laughs> many ways. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So listen, let, let, I'm interested in what you were saying a couple of times. You said you fell out, you fell out of love. You lost your mojo for some things, you know, in particular when you were talking about the health and fitness business and then kind of when you decided to leave the Virgin Startup and get into the podcasting. What, how, how, do, how do you deal with that when you've been doing something you really love and maybe you thought you were on a certain path with that and then it just doesn't kind of hold the same allure for you? How do you cope with that and how do you bounce back from it and find your mojo again? Yeah, it's, it's tough, isn't it? Especially, and you see, you see this quite often where people don't recognise that and don't leap out. <laughs> sooner yeah. than they do that they'll just think this this is literally it you know um look at the situation i mean the job i'm doing and we've all seen that I'm, I'm sure when you see people doing a job and you think oh my god they've been doing that job that job looks looks awful or that looks so hard have they not tried other things you know and yeah for me i, I guess i've i've been had the impetus to i mean again you you know yes i tried to make it a success and I think when you and for me it was just especially with the health and fitness it was it was when I left Virgin and I was basically going to be bankrolled um, for the first uh, what's the right phrase to call it like a children's play center and the idea was to open a bunch of these children's play center and I, I'd been told by somebody that I was had the backing of you know significant six figure sum to do that spent so long researching it, going all around the UK uh, to these venues, putting it together. And um, when I then presented a business plan and they were like, no. And I was like, what do you mean? No, it was literally, for, in my mind, it was just a matter of, you know, putting the business plan together. So then, you know, rejigged it, went back and it was still a no. And it was just like that, okay, I can think that they're, they're literally just going to say no to whatever I put in front of them. And that was just like a massive shit i've literally w wasted but of course you don't waste it six months of my life doing this and in hindsight it was clearly the best decision because again would i still be there 12 years later 
making coffees in a children's play center where my kids are now that much older. My God, it would have been mm. the worst thing in the world for me to do. So in, in hindsight, I'm grateful to that person for doing it. But, you know, at the time that led to me then going, shit, what else can I do? I've left Virgin. Uh, what can I do? Okay, well, I started a personal training qualification because I, I was always interested in health and fitness. And when I was at uni, I was coaching kids football for free on a Saturday morning. Um, and then I was going to America in the summer and coaching kids tennis. So I thought I like sport. I like coaching. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should be a personal trainer. And people always said to me, you should have been a PE or a games teacher. Yeah, that's what my mom and my family were always saying to me. But it's very different being a coach and being a teacher, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of put the two and two together and went, I started that. I've paid money for it. Let's go and do it. But it wasn't long before. Um, for me, there's only so many people I want to stand there in a room on my own and tell them to do 20 press ups for me it was just I lost the urge very quickly with that to be honest mm. with you and they don't mm. teach you the business side of that at all you know how to run a business they'll teach you the different training exercises but they don't teach you how to run a business and I soon became more interested in the running of the business part of that um, yeah. that's when I became you know saw this organization as I say NPE fitness and they taught you how to run a fitness business. You were a business owner. You were not a personal trainer. So mm. that, I think it was more, more than falling out of love with it even. It was I had my eye turned. And we all have that as entrepreneurs, as I know you would have done. But it, it's recognizing that as a, not just another shiny penny or that kind of magpie syndrome, but something that you could actually see, see the idea, recognize the opportunity, and then see the opportunity after balancing out, is it really an opportunity? Or is it just another shiny penny? So for me, I think it's just working that out in my own mind, but not spending so long over it that, again, you're just procrastinating, but recognizing at the time that, okay, so this isn't the what I thought it was going to be. And it still doesn't feel, I think it comes down to purpose, doesn't it? And, and your why. And for me, it was when I actually helped those kids through the YMCA that I actually thought, even though when I look back and think with the health and fitness, you were still helping people and that's maybe the current mm. theme that I see in my in my life when you, you know one of my favorite quotes is that Steve Jobs quote we only went it's only when you look backwards that you can join the dots and for me it's just helping people and I was helping people with their health and fitness goals then I was helping people with their business goals but it was definitely I think I didn't feel a sense of purpose when I was doing that in the health and mm. fitness and again with virgin startup helping people with other businesses i actually thought i'm not actually helping my own business mm. and again i think i was more interested in what i could achieve and maybe i also saw the opportunity of what others were succeeding and again the kind of richard effect maybe more subconsciously than anything and what i actually could achieve that there wasn't a ceiling on what i could achieve whereas within these organizations i just saw a ceiling from it so yeah it's, fasc yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because when you are an advisor, like you were with all those startups, you know, of course, that's massive. You've got the variety, you've got the innovation, you're helping people. But ultimately, you're not starting and finishing something yourself, are you? you all, you're on to the next one. So maybe there was that little gremlin there going, hang on a minute. Mm. Can I really do this? Can I? I'm a great advisor than everyone else. But when it push comes to shove, can I stand up and be counted as a true business leader and entrepreneur myself? I don't know if there was some of that. I've just kind yeah, of come well, into me just speaking, you know? No, that's a good, really good point. And for me, yeah, 100%, it actually came down to feeling like it was just a production line in a factory. Mm -hmm. And Virgin would literally, this would happen every day, was like, you know, here's Sally, who's got a beauty salon in, in Liverpool. Right, jump on a call with her. Um, you know, later that day, it would be, um here's john and neil they've got this idea for an app and so the variety was amazing and that's what i initially loved um mm. but very soon it became like a production line you know business plan financial forecast tick loan match you with a mentor next boom 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 boom, boom. and i built that yeah. up i did you know i had a team of advisors that i built up myself when they then you know the ceo called me in and literally said you've you know, you've had the best success of any business advisor we've ever had. Would you like this opportunity to actually, and again, maybe that comes down to, you know, entrepreneurial opportunities yeah. within other companies and then recognizing that um, and giving me the opportunity. But it soon became clear to me that again, there was a ceiling on how I could grow that business. I could only grow that business as fast as Virgin could grow. 
and I just kept meeting so much resistance and so much red tape. Um, I'll give I'll give you an example of uh, when I launched the podcast. It took them three months to approve the podcast, and then on a Friday I got a call going, "Okay, Virgin Startup, we like the podcast." I was like, "Thanks, only taking you three months." Um, this is now going to the Virgin Group. Um, okay, stand by your phone. Phone call. Okay, Virgin Group like it. Um, they're happy for you to do it. Next phone call. Okay, it's now gone to Virgin Media. Um, <laughs> Stand by your phone and literally carried on during the day through about four iterations of then, okay, it's gone to the Virgin PR, head of Virgin PR. And it was like, okay, so there's good news and there's bad news. They like the idea, but they've got the same idea with one of their own podcasts. I thought, really? They were like, can you go back into the studio, re-record every interview you've done for this podcast and actually come up with a different idea for the podcast? And I was just like, ah. Oh. I did actually think about it in hindsight for the weekend. I didn't dismiss it because I just saw the power of the Virgin brand is really strong. And I thought if I'm launching a podcast mm. with a Virgin brand behind it, that's pretty strong. But in the end, mm. I was just like, do you know what? If this is what it's going to be like all the time, then I'm off. I can't cope with it. Too much yeah. resistance for me. Yeah. And you make a really good point because there, come, there comes a, uh, sometimes a point where you go, actually, hang on a minute, this isn't really aligned with my values, the way I want to exactly. work, the, the kind of culture that I want to be in. And even though you had that massive love for Virgin overall, just at that time, it, you'd kind of, yeah, it just didn't feel right and time to move on. Right. Yeah. So so when you so let's talk about screw it, just do it then, Alex, because I love the title. Powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is, it is a nod to my former boss, Richard, because he wrote a book called Screw It, Let's Do It. Um, <laughs> so I wanted a little different angle on that. And at the time, the Virgin startup like, like that as a, as a title as well. So, yeah, I just yeah. kept it. And I have thought of changing it over the years. And, and people have just gone, oh, my God, you can't change it. Why would you want to change it? And I was just like, well, you know. Why would you want to change it? And maybe it's... Yeah, well, I just thought of like when I started the agency then as Podpreneur, I thought, do I want to call it Podpreneur? Because uh, I, I love chatting to people about their podcasts who are entrepreneurs. But um, no, I've stayed with it. It's too, it's too strong a brand um, to want to change it. Yeah. It's got a lot of energy, hasn't it? Mm. In, actually, yeah, I really, I, I reckon I'm that kind of person a lot of the time. Oh, sod it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Just, That's what it is. Yeah. How yeah. bad can it be, right? How bad yeah. can it be? I remember getting being getting asked to go to Russia to buy three businesses, and I remember thinking, "Geez, I've never. I don't speak Russian. Uh, I've never bought a business in my life at the time. And uh, but hey, I'll give it a go. If I fall flat on my face, I'll learn something. Screw it. Just do it. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, all those years ago, you were there in the background, Alex. We were meant to meet. We were meant to Indeed. meet. <laughs> <laughs> so so this brings us pretty close up to, to date then really with the podpreneurs so obviously passionate about podcasting um and we have we have some interesting conversations obviously you're being on brave bold brilliant now but um it's something that you're clearly passionate about and want to help again that theme of helping people through your career you, mm. it feels to me you're exactly where you should be right now with everything that you've described how is it with Podpreneur? What is it you love? What are the frustrations? What are the things that people can get out of by working with you, really? Yeah, I, and I, I, you're right. I, I actually wouldn't want to be doing anything else um, right now. And definitely it's been, it's been a long journey. And the last year has been super tough. Like I, this time last year, I just landed some really big clients, like all, the, all of the businesses, not all of them, but a lot of the businesses we were working with were like hundreds of millions of pounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest nail company, um, uh, the, the biggest supplier of shared office space in Europe as well, you know, some, some big companies and I was super excited. And then, you know, pandemic COVID hit and um, all of these big brands just said, come back to us in a year. And I'm like, huh? what do you mean come back in a year? And maybe that was naive of me at the time, but that, and, and you'll know this, you know, the decisions that big brands make, they're able to do that. Whereas for us small business owners, you are, um, your very livelihood depends on that cash flow. It's oxygen, you know, to not have that, to have that tap suddenly turned off was, was huge. But, you know, one of my clients stuck with me um, and I'll be, you know, forever grateful for them. And then, you know, during the course of the last year, there were shoots of recovery, shoots of recovery. And then I just seemed to hit this perfect wave of people 
you know, reinvesting um, their money. Yeah, and I was in live events before, but a lot of the companies like the Dells, the Microsofts of the world that I was working with as well, still had these big budgets that were approved, but they couldn't put them into live events. So they're putting them into, you know, online digital events, mm. podcasts, podcast sponsorship. So, and I know just from my research, when I set up Podpreneur as an agency that there were, I could only find, I, I couldn't even count them on my hand. The amount of people that were actually doing that in the UK at the time, there weren't. Um, yeah. And I know, you know, mutual friends of ours like Rob Moore and James Burt have got their own agencies. But, they, you know, on an app like Clubhouse, I, 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 could, I think I've only found one other person in the UK doing that. But now if you look in the UK, all these other agencies who might make websites or social media uh, agencies all go, oh, yeah, we do podcasts. And for me, it was like, we well, don't know what to do. As far as I'm aware, I was the only agency owner, podcast agency owner with their own number one podcast. So it's like, I actually know what it takes mm. to do that. And at the time I got to number two, four times before I got to number one. And in my mind, I, I just wanted to get to number one because it then gave me, I don't know, the clout to go, I've got a number one podcast. I know what it takes to get to a number one podcast. And maybe that's a bit daft in hindsight, but is the kind of way I wanted to roll with it. And, um, and I did, and yeah, hundred percent, I'm, I'm getting the benefits of that now. But yeah, it's been it's been a struggle to 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 get here. It's it's like you say, we we're chatting about it before. There's no such thing as overnight success. But um, there, there's a huge interest in audio. We were all clearly ahead of our time. You st we still get the question: Am I too late to the party? And it's like, <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Yeah, no, you're right because actually that tenacity to just keep going during the tough times that's what builds resilience and gets the results at the end. But I think so very often people are judging, you know, by what they see, either the outward success or the what they perceive as outward failure, but they have no idea what's gone along the journey <laughs> at all. Yeah. You know, so um, I, I mean, massive, massive congratulations because I can just see you're on the you're on the crest of a wave and it's going to just continue and continue. So it's um, brilliant what you're doing. I love it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Fingers crossed, I always say. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a couple of final questions. I could chat for hours, but in the, in the true in the true sense of podcasting, I know you'll be looking at the length of this episode and giving me some critical feedback. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it's super interesting chatting to you. It really is. So can you think of all those years of the illustrious experience in business that you've had and in life, actually, um, what the best piece of advice you've ever been given is? Yeah, um, I've been thinking about this one. And, and for me, given what I've done, how I've done it, it is just to focus in on one thing at a time, get that working, um, get that making money, if that's a business idea, before switching your focus to something else. And I need, I've done that all the time. I've done the opposite of that. I've always got two or three things going on at the time. And it very much is, you know, where, you're, uh, where your focus is, it grows and you know i know there's a phrase that i can't even remember where your focus is it's going to grow and where it doesn't it, it withers and dies and i've just done that all the time i've had two or three things going on at the time and then this year you know and it's been borne out by what's happening at the moment that we literally just had the best month um, ever you know like revenue wise number of clients wise that i've ever had in my entire life and that is because i literally made a decision to focus in on only one thing, which is Podpreneur, which is helping people launch their podcast or grow their existing podcast. Everything else, I just went, Shh, mm. leave it. And that is the best advice I've ever had um, without a shadow of a doubt. And I've heard it many, many times, but I never actually took it. I never took it. You know, I just thought I could keep all these other balls in the air at the same time. But it's just so difficult. And I think you can do that, but you need the right, systems and processes in place and you need to have got that one thing to a particular level before you can then shift your focus and then put the right people and the right system and the right processes in place yeah brilliant advice and uh, now yeah you're living and breathing it now so that's fantastic and the the, uh, the converse of that can you think of the worst piece of advice you've ever been given alex mm, that's such a good question and one which i didn't know whether i was going to be able to um 
to answer um i'm as a couple of things i could i could use here i'm going to go with one which I, th- I, I hear it quite a lot which is just you know just you know go with your heart go with your heart go with your gut um and whilst i think there is an element of truth to that i don't think you should wholly base all of your decisions on that because as i kind of alluded to before it is so different for everybody you really need to look at your individual circumstance and not necessarily you know go with your gut go with your heart you need to be ruled by your head as well and i think that's kind of borne out with the decisions you know my old boss richard has has made over the years you don't need to overthink something and i'm a great believer in that you know 80 20 rule get you know, 80% of it right and work out the rest of it on, on the fly or, you know, was it, what does Rob Moore say again? Start now, get perfect later, which is a yeah. great phrase. I love that. And he says it in every episode that he ever has, which is great. But I do think you need to, you know, be ruled by your, your heart and your head. Don't just be ruled by your gut or your heart because it could be such the worst decision you've ever made based on your individual circumstances. So I'd say that's probably the worst advice I've been given. I've heard it being given many, many times. Yeah. Great. I love that perspective on that. Yeah, totally. And my final question, well, actually my penultimate final question. So the first next one I'm going to ask you is where can people find you, Alex? Cause it's important that they can reach out to you. Yeah. Do you know, and the, the most the easiest place people can find me at the moment is over on my um, is over on Clubhouse. Probably. <laughs> yes. If they're on Clubhouse, which is I'm at Podpreneur on there. Um, likewise, my website is Podpreneur.co.uk. Um, but probably the most messages messages I'm getting at the moment is going to be on uh, Instagram, where I'm at Alexander, which is the uh, the only time I get called that is when I'm in trouble. Uh, Alexander Chisnell. Yeah, that's where I'm getting my most DMs at the moment. So if Alexander is in trouble, contact him on Instagram. Correct. Correct. <laughs> or, or anywhere else, just put in Podpreneur and you're going to pop up, aren't you? You'll Let's find me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That is great. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Alex. And final question. What does brave, bold, brilliant mean to you? Mm, I think it for me, it, it really resonates with, with um, screw it, just do it, funnily enough. As soon as I knew the name of your podcast, that going back a couple of months, um, that we've known each other virtually and now online. Um, for me, it, it, it's about, you know, it's about, um, about screwing it and just doing it, about being, being decisive, essentially, and owning it, not just procrastinating uh, and overthinking things. It's about making a decision owning it even if it might be the wrong decision often just making a decision is the best thing that you can actually do it's far worse to not make a decision so yeah that's that's what it means to me and I really resonate with it because it ties in with very much um you know my attitude to life and the guests I get on my podcast and um and uh, people who I kind of surround myself with yeah Fantastic. Oh, thank you Alex it's been such a pleasure chatting with you I've loved you it thank you so much me too. I could ch- I could chat for hours, but I know we both got probably plenty of things to sign off on. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Alex. Loved it. Thank you.